Hello, this is Ellen Madono speaking for Shadar Cases. This is case one, the first analysis. Uh, please, please keep your own notes and there will be a PowerPoint loaded next to the video on the site. This video will be in the case one um, page. Now I'm speaking to different people with different backgrounds. I clearly can't spell here, so just give me a little space. Um, this is the third time for me to do the course. If you're a newcomer to, to Shadar Cases, absorb what you can and don't worry. You can do the course again later, um, even if you just, you know, learn what you learn now. There's not much to lose. And now I know some students don't have much homeopathy background and so if what I say sounds very elementary, uh, please bear with me and um, understand that I'm trying to reach a variety of students. Dr. Shadar's analysis. The case is a NBWS case, a never been well since case, following an infection of IM, infectious mononucleosis. In such cases, the presenting symptoms and the original infection make up the picture that is the target of homeopathic in action. The primary infection is not resolved in the patient and is suffering from an internal struggle, still showing components of the primary infectious state of IM, infectious mononucleosis. The the infection by EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Okay. So I want to review these basic ideas that I've um, highlighted in bold. Now in this case, case one, there are some missing pieces of IM patient has forgotten these little pieces. The original IM is the primary infection, but those pieces are forgotten. Now we're going to talk about the underlying dynamic state. Dr. Shadar says, the remedy should be prescribed according to the changes following the infection. If we knew the details of his primary infectious state, the peculiarities of his IM symptoms, we would be able to consider those symptoms too. Now he talks about the peculiarities because this is homeopathy. We want to know what individualizes the student, uh, the patient. Um, and so if we had the primary uh, symptoms, we actually need to know fairly specific symptoms, not just that he had a fever or he didn't feel good, or something vague like that. We need very specific symptoms. Although the primary state seems to be not present now, it is actually present in the underlying dynamic state of the patient. Underlying dynamic state, the state of the patient that may not be totally um, visible in symptoms, but it's a changeable state because it's dynamic, it's not static. But it is, this underlying dynamic state, is distorted by the secondary defense mechanisms of the organism, so of the patient. So distorted sounds like something very bad. Um, but a, a more uh, neutral word would be adapted. So there's an adapt, adapt, adaptation that, that takes place, and these are the secondary defense mechanisms. So I'd like to discuss that. And the first um, examples are some psychological secondary defense mechanisms that you're all familiar with. Uh, so we keep others at a distance. We ignore problems, and we 
become offensive or passive aggressive. Um, all of this in the name of fear. I mean, that's the underlying feeling of the defense mechanism. Now, there are physical ad adaptations that are also sec secondary defenses. Uh, this is a joke. Um, maybe uh, those of us who can't seem to stand up straight um, because we have lower back pain are in reverse evolution. So the, uh, the gorilla came before us, and he has long arms instead of a cane, and he's leaning over. I don't know if he's exactly hunchbacked but he's leaning over. And when we have lower back pain, we start out young and we're standing up straight. Maybe our back hurts, but gradually our, we start looking like this uh, middle-aged lady. And as she becomes elderly, she actually looks a lot more like the gorilla. The causes for this stooping over can be multiple. She could have injuries, work stress, or she could have a prolapsed uterus. When the uterus is prolapsed, it comes from its, its ordinary position here and goes down into the vaginal cavity. I think this is probably very extreme, but any version of this uterus or other organs prolapsing will cause pressure here and this can be a cause for lower back pain. So you could have many different reasons, and they could be reasons that you have all three of the, the, the reasons for having the problem. Uh, there are what are called hidden diseases. I don't know if this is really a disease more than as much as it is an internal symptom. The blood vessels um, have many different layers and a tear in this inner layer here needs to be patched up so a tar something like a star scar tissue develops and that's the um, secondary defense and this uneven flow of blood through this tear would cause um, there to be some more buildup of plaque uh, on the inside of the vessel, and this would cause a clot. So we're going to return to the case. This 37-year-old man, was he? Um, was a 17-year-old 20 years before, had the symptoms of I am, but we don't know which symptoms he has. Um, you know, yeah, I am could have a great variety of symptoms affecting the brain, the cells lining the mouth, uh, the lungs, the liver, the spleen. It's a systemic lymphatic disease, so it causes. Um, a deficiency of uh, lymph cells, particularly um, it affects the B cells. Uh, so th there's an immune deficiency. A wide variety of places could be affected. So what do we know now from for this uh, patient? We know that that in, an internal struggle relate, remains. And the swelling of the lymph nodes in the neck are very typical of IM. Swelling in the tonsils are typical. Um, and he has this. So he, we assume that this is an internal struggle that is remaining. It's part of the um, defense me mechanism, but it's a very imperfect picture of I am. So secondary defenses are adaptions to pathological conditions. Do we repertorize them? Why or why not? I think someone found in documents that um, I didn't really mean to put up, uh, where it said you don't repertorize 
uh, the secondary defense mechanisms. But in this case, we don't have any information about the primary um, pathology. So we are forced to use the secondary defense mechanisms. In a sense, there is no absolute answer to this question because you have to consider the situation. This is uh, very typical of homeopathy. We have to use the symptoms that we have. Be careful in reading the document, reading ahead um, documents that are you might find um, in this, on this site. Um, um, really, it's best to just go from one case to another and get the idea one at a time. Now, Dr. Sh Sh Shadar presents the case. Uh, these first four rubrics here, these are all rubrics, they're not symptoms as such. I mean, when you find them in the repertory with this very peculiar kind of re uh, grammar here, this is a rubric, okay? And they represent symptoms of the case. Dr. Shadar is always talking about the symptoms of the case because he's talking, he's much more close to to the patient. Um, and you see that the number of remedies in these top four uh, rubrics is are very uh, very large. There's a very large number of remedies. And then there are fewer remedies uh, for the next five to to nine. Okay. So it's very important to uh, get this vocabulary of uh, symptoms, which are descriptions of the case, which are then translated into rubrics, you, uh, so we can use the repertory. Now, is this case a tricky case, do you think? Uh, we see some symptoms based on observation rather than patient reports. The doctor uh, noticed that the patient was talkative, loquacious, and he used the repertory, oops, can't spell again, repertory vocabulary to um, describe this condition. Uh, but otherwise, these are very clear, simple translations of um, the case report. Okay, Nothing very tricky here. Now, what is the rationale for symptom choice? What are the characteristic symptoms of IM? Out of all the symptoms that he could have chosen, why did he cho choose those individualizing peculiar symptoms? Let's see. So, these symptoms below, where there are fewer remedies, these are the individualizing symptoms. I don't think uh, 219 remedies or 217 remedies would be called individualizing. They're still not statistically significant. Okay. But these smaller numbers are individualizing. They're about the patient. They're not about I am in, uh, infectious mononucleosis in general. And why do we see so many um, candidates, so many uh, rubrics that could possibly be used? Um, these, this number in this row represents the difference between the rubrics in terms of the st statistical analysis. And even visually, there is not a lot of difference from especially these, all of these, all of the, the rem rubrics are in the, in the, up to number four, because those were such large numbers. And after that, there becomes, some, there's some holes, and more and more holes as you go on. Okay, but the difference between the rubrics right around here is not that great, not that striking. Okay, this is what you call a uh, rectangular uh, repertorization, not too informative.
as you see, if we consider all the common and peculiar rubrics in the repertorization, we will have many potential candidates such as pulsatilla, um, caliiodine, and iodine, docomara, rustox, belladonna, lachesis, uh, umbra. Hmm. aconite, sepia, bryonia, phosphorus, etc. What is this one here? Okay, so we have rubrics here, right? Not symptoms. And the ones up at the top are the common symptoms. I think these are common symptoms too. Um, and the peculiar Individualizing symptoms are the smaller rubrics. So you look at the numbers and you look at, at how many remedy choices he has. Are there some clearly top remedies? Are some of the remedies top? You know, maybe these are stronger, quite a bit stronger. This is 885, 875. 860, up to here, that's up, up to 9, they're in the 800s. Pulsatilla is over a 1,000, so I guess you would say that's strong, but you would have to go to the Materia Medica then to differentiate between at least the first ten, 9 remedies, which is that's a lot of... Um, differentiation then and how different is it from the ones after that. Okay, is there anything in common between these different uh, these different remedies here that you kind of know offhand? Um, I tend to remember which ones are the warm remedies. So when I look at this, I know which ones are. Um, this is ambergris, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I kind of know which ones are warm and which are cold, colder. Anyway. So Dr. Shadar's conclusion: a good prescription should cover both common and peculiar symptoms. The peculiar symptoms should not be sacrificed for the common ones. Okay. Visually, how are the common symptoms different from the less common symptoms? Well, we just discussed that it's a number of rubrics, uh, remedies, right? Will Taylor says a rubric containing more than 160 remedies should it not affect the statistical analysis. So most of these um, rubrics will not affect the statistical analysis. And so you have to ask, why does Dr. Shadar use such common symptoms? Okay, if 160 is the cutting point, then these are also common symptoms here. Okay. Why does he use them? Why does he decide to count symptoms that have no statistical value? Now you, ha you have to think about his larger technique. He's not just relying on the classical analysis. And think about other repertorizing strategies that use larger rubrics. Okay. And I think in general these are confirmatory strategies. These are strategies where you have some other method to check your classical analysis. Um, I, 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 just out of curiosity, I repertorized all the smaller symptoms. And um, if you look at these two lists here, you see that this is the original um, repertorization that Dr. Shadar did, and this is just the smaller symptoms. Uh, and, you know, most of the top remedies are here. These are all here. The, uh, 
Bratram album is not here. Causticum ambergrisia is here. Selium is not here. You know, the rest is up there. So is Bryonia. Um, the list is not terribly different, but I guess from Dr. Shadar's point of view, it is quite a, it's different enough to matter. And he wants those big um, rubrics in there. He doesn't want this kind of repertorization. What other strategies are there? Okay, there's the strange, rare, and peculiar strategy where you're trying to find a very weird symptom. There's symptom hierarchies. Uh, and you, you give aggravation sens sensations a higher priority. If you can find good ones, then you're very happy. And there are other confirmatory strategies that use large rubrics. For example, recently you have facial analysis, which is another miasmatic method that's very different from Dr. Shadar's method. And there's pol polarity analysis, where you're looking at the empirical value of... Um, not really different rubrics. I think it's of, of different um, remedies. I This is wrong here. It should be remedies. Um, the problem is the disease is not clearly defined if the larger rubrics are not used. Um, in Will Taylor's class on acute, um, acute uh, remedies, he often covers the, uh, the problem by the anatomical uh, location of the disease. So that would be the, um, here, it would be uh, external throat swelling, cervical glands. This is sort of what the major thing that was left from uh, the IM. Uh, memory, weakness of memory, this is also part of, and concentration, this is also part of IM. So is the weakness. Okay, so he's he's covering, but he this one he, it's a, it's a very much a location, and I think Dr. Shadar wants to be he wants to cover this area very completely, um, perhaps more than Will Taylor anyway. How can we be sure that we are covering the obvious, never never been well s since disease? if we don't have these big rubrics, I guess would be what Dr. Shadar would say, okay? So this is the end of analysis A of case one, and I hope to see you in the forum um, discussing the questions that have come up here. Thank you.